most software projects used to be built using a monolithic architecture approach. These big apps would render websites, talk to the databases, stream data, and contain all of the business logic inside. Over time, software teams realized that these apps became way too complex, they were difficult to maintain, and releases took forever to deploy. Everything had to be coordinated between different teams, and every change had to be tightly controlled. In essence, maintaining a monolith had substantially slowed down development speed. As a result, a better way of developing, maintaining, and deploying software was invented. In essence, the better way was to take that big monolith and break it down into smaller, self-contained units called microservices. Each unit would have its own context of execution, would have its own public API, and would represent a specific business logic. A development team would usually own one or multiple units. The idea was that each microservice would evolve independently of each other, which would increase the speed of development. The new microservices architecture assumed that each individual unit would have to talk to other units within the application, which means that units had to send requests and receive responses from other microservices. Most of these lines of communication were implemented using REST APIs. This means that there is a REST endpoint which reads a JSON file that requires validation of a specific request, such as a new product order request. This communication method worked great for a while, but we started to discover the problem with this model. The first issue was related to the synchronous nature of the request-response communication, which led to tight point-to-point -point coupling between the services. This made scaling of the new architecture challenging. In fact, some developers started to call this model a distributed monolith, which meant that the teams would still have to tightly coordinate deployment efforts of the big band releases. Another side effect of this model was that some teams made a mistake of exposing too many of the microservices to their customers, which led to a point when evolving those microservices became extremely challenging. The other problem was that one had to be very skillful at architecting microservice environments, and very few teams got it right the very first time. A lot of teams struggled with the responsibility issue, trying to understand who is responsible for what. The whole point of microservices was that each unit was only responsible for itself. But in reality, teams had to heavily coordinate their development efforts in order to keep the products working. Still another issue was related to adding new microservices into existing architecture. The problem with adding a new microservice was that the team behind it faced a bad circular logic problem. The team can't prove that a new microservice is of value to other teams because no one is using it, and the team can't convince other teams to use it because it cannot prove its value. Finally, a lot of software teams realized that using HTTP and JSON as means of communication, especially when the application requires high bandwidth communication, is actually pretty slow inefficient, and compute-intensive. Fortunately, most of these issues have now been addressed and appropriate solutions have been put in place. These solutions are related to several specific patterns that form today's best practices of building scalable microservices architectures. The first pattern that is very useful in the context of the microservices architecture is the API gateway. 
This pattern is helpful in addressing the issue of exposing too many microservices to the customers. The way it works is that you want to place the API gateway in front of the microservices. Therefore, the clients will know only about the API gateway while the rest of the communication pipes will be hidden from them. Instead of every microservice in the system performing the functions of API authentication, request response logging, and throttling, having an API gateway doing these functions up front will add a lot of value. Clients calling your microservices will connect to the API gateway instead of directly calling your service. This is even more necessary when a third party is accessing your service as you can throttle the incoming traffic and reject unauthorized requests from the API gateway before they reach your microservice. You can also choose to have a separate API gateway that accepts traffic from external networks. The second pattern that helps scale and run microservices smoothly is the service mesh, which is a software-driven approach to routing and segmentation. The goal is to solve the networking and security challenges of operating microservices and cloud infrastructure. Service mesh solutions bring additional benefits such as failure handling, retries, and network observability. In essence, Service Mesh is the distributed internal API gateway. If you look at the standard API gateway, it operates within the context of the north-south traffic. This is the traffic that is heading in or comes outside of your network and it goes through the API gateway all the way down to the individual microservices. We want to take this useful north-south traffic and apply it to what we call east-west traffic. The east-west traffic is the traffic among the various microservices. This traffic is considered to be distributed compared to the centralized north-south traffic. The idea here is to let the centralized functions of routing, logging, and rate limiting to operate within the distributed fashion. The way we accomplish this task is by utilizing so-called sidecars. The sidecar design pattern has been recently gaining popularity and wider adoption within the community. As a sidecar is attached to a motorcycle, similarly, in software architecture, a sidecar is attached to a parent microservice and enhances its functionalities. A sidecar is loosely coupled with the main microservice. The goal of the sidecar design is to reduce the complexity by abstracting the common functionalities to a different layer. Besides, this approach reduces code duplication since you do not need to write configuration code inside each microservice. Finally, it provides loose coupling between application code and the underlying platform. One way to think about the sidecars is to view them as libraries that grow their own environments. The idea is that you can deploy these sidecars next to every microservice and unlike the library, it is language agnostic. One can write a sidecar in Python and deploy it next to the microservices written in Java, Rust, Go, or PHP. This way, all of these separate microservices can get the same sidecar, which often reduces the overhead related to the organizations trying to maintain microservices in various different languages. The sidecars are considered to be shared functionalities that can be replicated across the entire application. The third pattern that is crucial in designing microservices correctly is the event-driven approach. Remember we talked about how difficult it could be to add a new microservice to the application due to the circular logic issue? Well, the good news is that we can overcome this problem by adopting the event-driven architecture instead of the request-response one. To compare these two approaches, we will use an equivalent real-life example of a passenger ordering a taxi from a ride-sharing app. In this example, the passenger is asking a question, what time does my taxi arrive? In the REST API world, the driver would respond with a specific time, say 8.45 p.m. However, if we change the question to, is my ride ready? 
the driver would respond with the answer no. As the answer is not the expected one, the passenger will have to continue asking the same question until they finally receive the expected answer. From a human perspective, this situation is quite repetitive and annoying. Event-driven API interaction patterns differ from REST API. In the event-driven world, the event would be initiated by the driver. The passenger has to define an endpoint that the driver can call in order to send the notification. The passenger is notified as soon as the piece of information is ready. This type of interaction is referred to as webhook and is a preferred style of asynchronous API. This kind of interaction forms the basis of event-driven architecture. Microservices have fundamentally changed the way applications are built these days. Rather than a single giant monolithic code base hosting all of the business logic inside, microservices reflect the distributed systems model where a group of application components work together to deliver the business needs. By following the microservices best practices discussed in this presentation, you should be able to build better architected apps that scale well.